Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. We compliment them by the number of health science programs we have. The vision that landed a medical school on the campus of the University of Louisiana Monroe. The big irony here, uh, at first they didn't like solar power. The win for big business that could become a PR blunder. Music is never something that we actually sought out. And yet people can't get enough of the sound they've created. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first there's news today about the estimates of the state's surplus budget and where it stands. Those estimates grew to $500 million with the announcement this morning from Commissioner of Administration Jay Darden in a joint budget hearing. It's news that adds more fuel to the ongoing debate among candidates for governor over the state's financial stability and tax rates. Governor John Bell Edwards previously expected the leftover cash from the budget to top $300 million. Now here's other headlines making news across our state. The state Thursday became part of a tentative settlement with Purdue Pharma, the makers of the drug OxyContin. Chief Deputy Attorney General Bill Stiles says the AG's office believes the deal will help stem the tide of the opioid epidemic. He says better to settle now and not risk getting nothing from Purdue in the event Purdue files bankruptcy. This tentative agreement between Purdue, thousands of local governments and states, including Louisiana, could be worth up to $12 billion over time. More people in our state are covered by health insurance as more people nationwide, increasing numbers, are not. New data released this week from the Census Bureau shows those uninsured in the state is now about 8.5% compared to 8% the year before. Nationally, the numbers show 8.9% of the population living without health insurance. Our numbers are largely driven by the state's Medicaid expansion program. Disputes continue about Medicaid expenditures. The question's coming in a report this week from the state's legislative auditor. Darrell Papura's office says $47 million in Medicaid payments for mental health services did not follow the health department's fee schedule. The health department says it did. This was the latest report from the auditor digging into the state's $13 billion Medicaid program. Fifty members of the state National Guard are being deployed to Afghanistan to support troops on the ground there. The Guard members will provide air and medical support. This deployment is scheduled to last one year. Governor John Bell Edwards announcing that $42 million in storm protection projects are going to Lafourche Parish. Most of the money, about $36 million, comes from the state's share of offshore oil and gas leases. Under the Gulf Energy Security Act, we're among four Gulf Coast states that gets some of the money generated from offshore oil and gas production. Also in the news, Louisiana's Republican Ag Commissioner defended his record Monday against two farmers challenging him in the fall election. His opponents say the state needs to offer more help for agricultural producers adapting to changing times and climate issues. Incumbent Mike Strain, a veterinarian who's held the office since 2008, says Louisiana's agriculture and forestry industries have doubled in value during his time in office with the commissioner candidates raise the gasoline tax to deal with challenges that farmers are facing. If it is guaranteed to go to the roads and what that amount would be, what I've advocated is that for the legislature to put it on as a constitutional vote and that those monies, whatever that number is, there has to be an appropriate share to go into the rural areas, an appropriate share to go back across the state. I agree with Commissioner Strain, except I believe that that money should come from the repealing of industrial tax exemptions, not on a tax 
for individuals' gas purchases. Right now, we incentivize gas and oil to come into our communities and build uh, facilities, and we give tax breaks that are up to 90-something percent in a lot of situations. I wouldn't have a problem with a tax incentive or a tax increase, but I think the problem would come to where you have folks that's living in the cities that really don't have farming interests. And maybe a smart incentive program, just like you have off-road and on-road diesel, you can have designated gas stations in these certain areas for farmers. The question is about climate change. Do commissioners believe, candidates believe it's a man-made problem and what can they do to impact it? Of course it's man-made. We have inhabitants all over this earth that's dwelling in places that we normally didn't dwell at the beginning. But to answer the question, I'm a conservationist. I grow trees, I plant trees. The biggest balancing of climate is to plant a tree. I believe that what the state of Louisiana should be doing is exploring industries that actually caption, capture carbon and create economies, like biochar. Um, we can use things like our bagasse refuse from cane farmers and actually create soil amendments that increase soil health and capture carbon back into the soil. Is man part of that? Absolutely. And man's got to be a part of that solution. When you look at agriculture, agriculture contributes about 9%. What can we do? Some of the new studies change in the way we do things. Row rice, for instance. If we plant rice, row rice, new type, markedly less water, 75% less water. While farmers are stewards of the earth and they always want to do what's best, sometimes the world changes really quickly around us. As a practicing farmer I know, staying up to date with best practices isn't always intuitive, unfortunately. I'm your current commissioner. I believe I have the education, the background, and experience to lead us forward. We've passed more than 100 legislative instruments, 100 bills since I've been commissioner, streamlining the department, eliminating old law, moving the department into the future. We've made market strides working together. Well, that's one very, very important item that we didn't discuss. The newly passed industrialized hemp. I think the hemp, with the industrialized hemp with a proper foundation and a proper application, can create those new jobs, can restore the interest of the 21st century young folks. Strain faces four opponents on the October 12th ballot. Two Democrats, Green and Williams, participated in the forum at the Press Club on Monday, but two others, Democrat Charlie Greer and Republican Bradley Zonbrecher, are also running. Hey, is there a question you want to ask one of the men who hope to be your next governor? Incumbent John Bell Edwards and challengers Representative Ralph Abraham and businessman Eddie Responi. Well, you can submit questions online at lpb.org for the governor's debate. LPB and Council for Rebetta, Louisiana are sponsoring the debate, which will air on LPB Thursday night, September 26th at 7 from the campus of UL Lafayette. It's going to be live on LPB and also streaming live at lpb.org. Well, when the Public Service Commission meets, it usually doesn't draw a crowd or controversy, but this week in Baton Rouge, it did. Yeah, it definitely did. It's because <laughs> the commission voted to change the rules on solar panels to the benefit of utility companies and the detriment of those homeowners who installed the panels to save money on their electric bill. I think it's criminal. I, I think what we're doing here is wrong. The CEO um, of Posigen Solar, Tom solar Nahart, state, told the commission it was another win for monopolies in Louisiana. Their vote to lower the amount of money new us. solar homeowners will get from utilities for excess power beginning January 1st. The color green worn by solar advocates dominated a standing room only crowd. Eric Skirmetta represents Metairie and the North Shore and voted for the change. For as much as about six years, there's been a cap on uh, net metering on uh, home use, uh, simply because of the growth of it had to be uh, analyzed how, and how it affected other ratepayers in the state who don't use solar. Foster Campbell, who represents the PSC in North Louisiana, was strongly against the change and voted no. There's about two million people in Louisiana that are on investor-owned companies like Swepco or Energy Corporation or Clico. Central Louisiana Electric Co-op, two million. Uh, there's only about 20,000 people that have solar installations on the roof, basically. So you think about that, that's a little bit less than 1%. But now the companies are uh, upset about it, if you want to know the truth, they're upset because they would like to, they don't like this trend because they would like to sell you all of the electricity. 
And when you generate electricity on your home, uh, you cut your bills down that you have to pay. This is more trouble than it's worth. It's not worth arguing about. But they just want it their way. And the companies now, the, the big irony here, uh, at first they didn't like solar power. Now the companies, including Energy, is going over to West Baton Rouge and putting in a big plan. So that sort of say, oh, you didn't like it, but it was so bad that you decided to put in uh, several million dollars in building a big plant in West Baton Rouge. We have one going up in Caddo Parish, millions of dollars. And we have one going over in Morehouse Parish. You have one that's being trying to be put together in Lincoln Parish. So they know it's a good deal. They know that it's clean and people are going to demand clean energy. And so what they're trying to do is uh, make sure that they're the provider of solar power in Louisiana. And uh, too bad, they're too bad. It's not, it, we, it's not to that point yet. It's not hurting their profits. It might be hurting their feelings, but it's not hurting their profits. Now those homeowners who already have solar or will by the end of the year, those changes will be grandfathered in for them. The new medical school being built on the campus of the University of Louisiana Monroe could ultimately lead to huge benefits for the entire state. Edward Via College is footing the bill to build it and operate it and hopes to end a physician shortage that is plaguing the state for many years. It's not quite finished, but the Edward Via College of Medicine on the campus of the University of Louisiana Monroe is changing more than the landscape of Northeast Louisiana. This new med school that we can see from here right. clearly um, will mean something for the entire state No overall. question, no question. These young physicians that'll be trained in that building and other areas will serve in medical offices and hospitals and clinics throughout Louisiana. They already have partnerships across the state, so these young physicians will be moving out into the communities and making a difference to all of Louisiana. The road to this groundbreaking back in September of last year wasn't without a few bumps. We had discussions with two uh, prior schools, and unfortunately they both just did not work out. And it was quite disappointing, uh, and many people really felt at that time it would not happen. Um, but I promised the community that if it was feasible, we would make it happen. It's happening, and soon, the fully accredited Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine, Louisiana campus, is scheduled to admit its first students in the fall of 2020. We, as a group, the university, the community, and the state, uh, work together uh, to basically continue the search for a suitable partner. And VCOM came along. Actually, one day I'm at my office, it's raining, and I get a call from this person I didn't know, Dr. Dixie Tuk Rollins, who is the president and provost for VCOM. And she said, we'd like to drop in and visit. An hour later, the president of VCOM and other school leaders were touring the ULM campus. Came by and it was a miserable day. The campus just didn't look like it does today. But they walked around and looked at it. Mr. Rockovich, John Rockovich, who's the chairman of the board said, why do you want us here? And I told him, I said, to improve the, the uh, standard of living for the people in this region. They need it badly, you know. And uh, he said, well, maybe our cultures will fit and maybe they won't. I said, well, you may find a, you know, a more, a better financed, a larger partner, but you're not going to find one that'll work with you better than ULM. A couple of weeks later, Dr. Bruno and a delegation from the Monroe community would tour two of the university's other medical campuses in Blacksburg, Virginia, and Spartanburg, South Carolina, and were more than impressed. Was just blown away by what we saw, uh, the attention to detail, the pride in their, their product. And Edward Via was apparently impressed with ULM. Within a few months of that visit, it was a done deal. The massive four-story, 100,000-square-foot building scheduled to be complete in December didn't cost the state or the university a dime. VCOM is renting the land where it's being built, and VCOM is footing the bill for the $40 million building and its operating cost. 
you got 40 million in facility, but they've got faculty already here that they have to pay in advance of opening to develop the program. Uh, so I would, I would say they're probably going to be somewhere invested in Louisiana, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 50 to 60 million before the first students come in. And there's probably no one more excited to get those first students in and studying than Dr. Ray Morrison, the dean of the new med school. There's just a, a, a paucity of primary care physicians throughout northeastern Louisiana and, and actually throughout the entire state. 19% uh, down in the number of physicians that we have. And we looked at what our mission was and how we wanted to address that shortcoming. The University of Louisiana Monroe's location and needs falling in line with Edward Via's mission to prepare globally minded, community focused physicians to meet the needs of rural and medically underserved populations and promote research to improve human health. There's just not enough docs in this state and they're aging out, they're getting older and they're retiring from practice and who's going to take care of the patients? Dr. Morrison gave us a tour of the nearly finished med school outlining the curriculum and the many amenities of the school. This is going to house basically uh, all four years of the students, actually two student or two groups of students, the first and the second year class will be in the building the entire first two years and then when they go out to the clinics and out on rotations they leave the building, but they have to come back for testing. He says they'll work closely with ULM as they tackle research projects and in other areas of medicine. That allows us to, to work with the kinesiology program, the nursing program, even dental hygiene program, we'll be working with them. Physical therapy, the social uh, aspects of counseling. Dr. Morrison says the students and faculty of both schools will benefit greatly from the partnership. What we're doing is we're building the future for the state of Louisiana in the fact that we're producing physicians and when they graduate and they come back here they'll start seeing those kids that they saw at the Walmart or that they saw at the grocery store and they'll say said I remember you and said yeah now and then I'm working with Dr. So-and-so and I'm his partner or her partner and then there'll be the same thing as we go out into the small towns of uh, Louisiana and the greatest part will be if we're doing what we intend to do and have the resources to do we're going to affect it all those towns and bring up those numbers of primary care physicians. Back in the president's office, Dr. Nick Bruno was thinking back to that first conversation years ago and the first mention of a med school on campus. He says he was heading to Monroe to become the president of ULM and stopped in Delhi to talk to Senator Francis Thompson. He asked me what did I see for this campus and I said I want to see our campus well known around the state for how good it is. And he said in his own way, he says, I don't know why we can't have a medical school here. We need one. And I said, well, maybe we have to work on that. And he did. The Edward Via Medical School will accept 150 students next fall, and those students will be the first class to earn their medical degrees in the year 2024. You know, the first audiences to hear the Photo Sisters, born in South Louisiana, were elderly residents of area nursing homes. The girls were elementary students who had a good ear for piano and string instruments and later found out they could sing, too. Boy, can they ever. They're now performing all over the U.S., and it seems the sky is the limit. But there's something about how grounded they seem, how genuine, that really has fans wanting more. Where you find one photo sister, you will likely find three. This trio, along with a piano and their string family. Whether a cappella or in harmony with their personal orchestra, together the ensemble produces a sound that has fans nationwide wanting more. The shepherd's voice is in our Their music genre isn't defined by one category but instead blends sacred, classical, cinematic, and pop styles. And being multifaceted may be perfectly fitting for the Photo Sisters because they can do so many things. As we met for this interview, they were on location producing some music videos for their website for their fans to hear the latest. The Photo Sisters have been performing together for 18 years since they were little girls.
spending hours and hours of time and practice because they liked it. And though their talent became evident, it might surprise you to learn it wasn't necessarily their dream to be on stage, though it became a way to deliver a message they had, a message of hope. Music is never something that we actually sought out. It's really something that we felt like um, from the beginning, God just kind of placed in our laps. So we've never had like these long-term goals of something we really want to see take place or happen or meet up to. And so I guess from this perspective, we've never had like this, yes, we're going to pursue this for the next 10 years till we meet these goals. Um, so we say for now, I guess, because like we don't know it's in the future. We just kind of take one step at a time and what the Lord gives us. Galen, Caitlin, and Adeline Photo were born two years apart and grew up with their parents in the historic East Feliciana town of Clinton. They're now in their 20s and so close in age, they say many fans thought they were triplets. In general, we're best friends. We've, for the past few years, all shared one bedroom and it's been great. Great, but that kind of familiarity can be a real life teacher, an important lesson as their star is rising, and it is as they've relocated to Nashville to meet the demands of recording, collaborating, and writing with other musicians. Each having different personalities and approaches to music, and we've had to learn how to understand each other's gifts and strengths, um, and weaknesses also, and be gracious to each other in those. So it's finding the balance and um, working together and understanding and helping each other and being humble to admit, oh yeah, I didn't do that so well, I can improve on that. What is the mountaintop for you? For me, the Grand Ole Opry would be my dream. For them, the Carnegie Hall would be their dream. What was your first big break, or has it come? We've had some really exciting opportunities, whether it's um, playing for NFL football games. Those have been pretty, first of all, it's, it's awesome being able to sing your national anthem. What so proud? And in the case of the Photo Sisters, they did sing it before a Broncos game in Denver. And they played it in their uplifting style of string music before a Saints game in New Orleans. And it brought down the house in the Louisiana Super Bowl. What's the platform that you stand for, that the group stands for? That's a great question. That platform, well, first of all, we wouldn't be where we are if, um, if the grace of God were not in our lives to have um, brought our parents to where he did in their lives. and for them to want to raise us for His glory. So our platform is really to lift up His name and share it with the world and the hope that He brings. Sweet sounds, huh? The eldest photo, Adeline Addie, married earlier this year, and she is now expecting twins. Mara Liason, a national correspondent for NPR, makes a trip to the capital city. She came in late last night and since early this morning has been doing what she does best, talking, sharing her unique perspective as a longtime political correspondent for NPR. Yeah, she's been busy. A featured guest speaker of the WRKF Founders Luncheon in the capital city today. And before that was a guest speaker at LSU's Manship School of Journalism. It was there that she presented the dilemma for Democrats as they try to counter what the GOP and President Donald Trump is doing. And that is a big question that the Democratic Party is facing right now. I mean, do they want to be the left-wing mirror image of Donald Trump? Just play to their base. Just, just because he went so far to the right and got elected, does that mean that they can go far to the left and, and, and succeed? 
I think that that hasn't happened yet. I think there are a lot of people in the Democratic Party who think it's a mistake. Um, identity politics is toxic. Over the years, Liasson has covered seven presidential elections and reports on political trends beyond the Beltway. Well, everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our brand new app. Download it for free from your app store. This upgraded version features news, public affairs, documentaries, how-tos, and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.